Welcome to another moment in the Word. Are you looking forward to the return of Christ? Are you looking forward to his coming? John writes that every man that has this hope in himself, the hope of the return of Christ, purifies himself even as he is pure. In other words, the awareness of Christ's return, it changes us. Well, it certainly does, and Jesus intended that his disciples with that knowledge would be changed. In fact, that they would have hope. In in fact, he's encouraging them in the passage we're looking at, and I pray this passage encourages you. We're looking at only one verse. It's the final verse of chapter 16 in Matthew's gospel. It's verse 28, and it reads like this. Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He begins with the word verily, amen, literally is the word. It's a Hebrew word, you often say, amen. But what it means is so be it. It means truly, it means a fact. Jesus is the amen. He is the amen. And so consequently, we want to see, well, what is this? If this is the consummation, this is the fulfillment then the fulfillment of what? The fulfillment of an argument, a fulfillment of a line of thinking that Jesus has been given to his disciples. He said to Peter, Peter, the very idea of you preventing me from going to the cross, that's not thinking like God. That's thinking like Satan. You are thinking like a man. And then Jesus turns to all of his disciples and he says to them that you, first of all, must deny yourself if you're going to be my disciple. You must take up your cross and that you must follow me. The first two we found were in the heiress. That means in a point of time. It means intentional. It means that there is an ongoing decision that is made to deny self. And you'll be doing that through the rest of your Christian life. There is that taking up of the cross. Luke says it's daily. And that is that it is a discernment. It is a decision on your part that you are going to choose to identify with Christ, even at the cost of rejection by others, and that you're going to follow him. And then he gives you three reasons why. The first reason is that whosoever should save his life is going to lose it. And so then the question is, well, what is your life? What is it that you're putting your, your emphasis on in your life? And Jesus emphasizes that. But then he goes to another argument. It's a greater argument than he's describing than what is the world. What is it if you give your soul, your life, in exchange for the things of this world? And the world's passing away. And everything that is of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, it's not only passing away, but it's not of the Father. It's not of God. And so consequently, if I'm a disciple, I must deny myself and deny the affections of this world. That's the second argument. Then he moves to the third argument. And the third argument also is found in verse 27. And it begins with four. Notice that all three of these verses did. For the Son of Man shall come in glory. And now he is taking it from looking at us, looking at the world, to looking at him. And why is the Son of Man coming in glory? Because he is God. Now that is powerful. That's incredible. And he's focusing then in explaining who he is. He's coming in glory. He's coming in power with authority, all of his angels. And that is to judge every man and reward those according to their work. For the believer, it's faith. It is trusting him. Now that leads us right into the next verse. So we're seeing the context. When we look at this in the context, Jesus is saying truly. And he's using this now to encourage And I pray that this encourages you because he's just talked about his glory. And now he says, I, this is the eternal God, say unto you. So it's a promise of hope. There are some that are standing here who shall not taste death 
until they see, and that word for see is not just see physically, but they understood with their mind, much like Herod, who understood that the wise men he had dispatched to discover, discover where Jesus was born and come back to him. He saw, but that doesn't mean he physically saw, he understood that he had been betrayed. Now, do you see, and these that were standing with Jesus, he says they will see that the Son of Man is coming in his kingdom. Notice the first time we saw in the previous verse that Jesus was describing his coming in glory. We see that we know that John writes, who's one of his disciples, John chapter 1, verse 14, that which was the, the word which was made flesh dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory. We then wonder, well, then what is he talking about here? Because now he's talking not only about his glory, but his kingdom. And the word basilea has the idea not of a place, but of his authority, that he is ruling with authority. Notice what we find then in Peter because right after this, we're going to the, t the transfiguration at Mount Tabor. And we find here in verse, uh, verse uh, 16 of chapter 1 in Second Peter, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power, now notice that, the authority, and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That word majesty in the Greek, it means that which has dominion and authority, and it's greater than Pilate. It's greater than Herod even. It is describing that which is having a large territorial power and authority. It's used in, in uh, Acts chapter 17, describing Diana, where she has great influence as a deity over all of the Mediterranean on the eastern side. And now, when Peter is writing, he says, we have beheld his glory, we've beheld his majesty. It's one thing to look at Christ and to realize he is God, but Jesus is taking it further, and he is saying he is God who has come into this world to reign. You see, when Adam was given the responsibility to have dominion over the earth, he abdicated that responsibility when he, when he believed the lie and took of that which God prohibited. As a result, the authority was then given to Satan, who is the God of this age. Jesus is come back to now take what is rightfully man's. But now he has to do that as the son of man. That's why you find this expression used over and over again. So then what is this? Some that are standing here, that's his 12 disciples, but there are also others that are in the area because this is at Caesarea Philippi. In this area where there's great demonic activity, in this citadel of Satan, in this place where the gates of hell literally are, that Jesus now is saying, I am establishing my kingdom. Just in a week, Jesus will take three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they'll go up unto the mountain, and he will expose his glory. That which is on the inside becomes manifest outwardly. It's clear he is God. But is that it? Well, it's a part. It is a part, but it's not the full of his kingdom. Because what we see now is that Jesus will later die, just as he said to Peter, and he will rise again the third day. And he will ascend into heaven. Is that the fulfillment? It's a part of it. It's a part of the establishing of his kingdom, his reign, his power, his authority on the earth. But is that the complete of it? No. And then we find after that the whole book of the Acts. The Acts of the Apostles as moved by the Holy Spirit. Is that the completion of it? Well, it's a part of it. And you can see now what Jesus is talking about. Yes, they saw the kingdom and they can put it together. But is that all of it? No, it's not. 
In 70 AD, there was the destruction of Jerusalem. It was clear then that the manner in which the Jewish people had sacrificed could no longer be carried out. And so Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the covering that is of blood as a result of a sacrifice, cannot and has not been made since 70 AD to the day in which now we live. Because the temple is gone. But does that mean that Christ is not reigning? No, because he died. He died on the cross that was a final offering of himself and his blood that covers your sin, my sin, and the sin of the whole world to as many as believe. Oh, but is that the fulfillment of it? No, he goes beyond even that. Because then we find that there is a description that John gives in the book of Revelation, where in chapter 21, there is a new Jerusalem, that there is going to be a time when there will be no sun, because Jesus is the sun, he is the light, he is the glory, and he will then reign, and that reign is forever and ever and ever. So then, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about that which is in part that will be continually manifested in fulfillment of his reign. You, in your own life, perhaps, have experienced that. You've seen as you have lived every day, walking with the Lord, reading and meditating in his word, praying, that there's been a growth, a change. It didn't stop the day you accepted Christ. It continued. It's been building. And it's not complete yet because someday you're going to put off this fleshly, this carnal, and you're going to put on the eternal and the glorious. Oh, I thank God for this passage. It can be confusing. But as you meditate on it, it's actually very encouraging, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you, Father, for how you encourage us and that even this, your promises, all of them in Scripture are given for us that we might be encouraged and that we might be faithful and that we might serve you and that we might not be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God into salvation. For it's in your holy name we pray these things. Amen.